Um, after a career in hospice care, um, Diane James moved to Blue Cross Pet Bereavement Support Services, where she works tirelessly and creatively to promote understanding and compassion for people experiencing pet loss. And Diane, I should say that Diane's remit includes pet loss in terms of people who've experienced that their pet's been stolen, um, people who have to, due to changing circumstances, surrender their pets, and of course, um, pet death. Um, so I'm going to hand over. Um, thank you, Diane. Uh, thank you. I'm um, going to leave my camera off. I don't think you can see because I've got a train today. And I also have to say that I didn't write that introduction. <laughs> so anyone who knows me, I didn't write, I work tirelessly, I promise you. Um, what I'm going to tell you today is a little bit slightly different than um, I normally do because a lot of people out there will understand about the topic. Um, but I will touch on it. I'll just tell you a little bit about Blue Cross. We started in 1897. And we have probably one of the oldest animal hospitals in the UK, uh, still in Victoria, still tirelessly working away there and treating thousands of animals every year for lower pay people. But what we work with and what my team and in that team, I include our tireless volunteers. Now I'm using the word tireless, which I do normally. Um, we support over 14,200 people last year on the phone and by email. And that was just people that we responded to. Um, without those that sort of put the phone down or communicate in other ways with us, including our literature. So when I'm, I'm going to look at through this now, sort of past and present, um, accepting and understanding um, what pet bereavement is, um, look at the challenges and the changes that are happening as we, we've worked with it, and the way that we, we're going to go forward. And I'm a bit excited about when Julie Marie and I started last year discussing this, how far it's progressed and the interest there is out there in pet breeding. I think the word excited is the right one to use, but um, like I tell everyone, it's a vocation, not a job. But one thing that I have learned, whether it be human loss or animal, is we shy away from talking about death. We tend to not use the word dead, dying, death, because we feel that it's almost as if it doesn't hurt us or we don't have to think about it if we don't use them. So as a nation, I think we're way, way behind many others in the way that we look and relate to the loss of, of anything, but particularly um, the way we look, look at the loss of our animals. So what do I mean by um, acceptance and understanding? Well, pet bereavement, and, um, as Zoe talked about earlier, the word bereavement, everybody associates with dying, but bereavement is actually any type of loss. So Julie Marie said we, t we deal with people who've had animals stolen, um, who've lost them, pre-euthanasia, uh, animals that you know, um, have been euthanized, animals who've, who've died of old age, accidents, uh, a need to rehome, be it financial, a relationship breakup, so absolutely any type of loss. And if we could only get people to realise that it encompasses everything, the word bereavement, it would be great. Um, as a service, it, we did look at changing the name, but again, after sort of 26 years of it being a wonderful service that it is, we felt that we should leave the name pet bereavement as it was. So does pet loss differ to that of a human? Well, do you know, I have many a discussion on this with people as um, a lot of people say, how can you put it into the same context? How can you feel the same way? But I have to say, we are all different. We are all unique in how we grieve and what we grieve over. We get callers. It can be, you know, a bone of contention with people that say they miss the loss of their pet far more than they do their, their parents. Um, it, will people find that strange? Of course they will. But again, they have to understand that human animal bond that people have. And when they lose that pet, it's a huge loss in their lives. So people can sometimes fail to understand it, not because they haven't had a pet, which is a, you know, a lot of cases where people don't understand, but it can be where, for example, it's a different type of relationship. It's a working relationship. Um, so it's a different type of loss. The impact on them can be immense and it can be doubly different because they relied on that assistance animal as a lifeline as well as a pet relationship. So people just don't realise how different it can be for each individual. So over the years we've been looking and we've been working at different ways that we can make pet bereavement more accepted and more understood. And I have to say that the encounters that I have with the majority of um, the large vet organisations and vets, they are compassionate, they are kind, um, and they have really come on, I would say, over the past few years in how they want to 
deliver and work with their clients with pet bereavement because a lot of the times we forget how much it impacts on them as well. So we work closely with them on their well-being because compassion fatigue through euthanizing pets, especially in things like COVID, is immense on them as well as the owners. So it's something that uh, we're really pleased that it has become more well-known and more accepted now. So what type of challenges and changes are there out there? Well, over the years, we found that um, the biggest one has always been with employers accepting the loss of a pet and how they work with that and how they work with, with their teams and their staff when, when their pet dies. Now, um, you might recollect that back about a year ago, a lady in Scotland who worked in um, a sandwich shop would be the best way, so I don't get uh, drawn in, um, had to take time off because her dog dies that she'd grown up with from a very early age. And her employer said, unless you could get cover or find anybody, then she'd lose a job. And it became a lot um, out in the national press. There was a massive amount of information out there. Um, people were doing um, protests and sending in, um, gosh, I can't think of the word, but they were sending in a uh, you know, number of, of information and going through to different um, employers and trying to challenge that it should be part of bereavement leave. And we were involved in a lot of um, occasions where we went on TV or we talked in the press and people were surprised by our response because it's not that we don't think that people should have bereavement leave. What we think is people who employ people who have pets should be more compassionate and understanding. Um, and that's where we would like to see the change. We appreciate that obviously you can't give paid leave for people because we had numerous comments about it's only a hamster, it's only a cricket. But what we're trying to know to people is that no matter what animal or pet it is, the person loved them and they lost them. And that we did appreciate, um, you know, as a charity and a bereavement service, that we couldn't, um, you know, sort of stand on the side of we agree with pet bereavement leave. What we're trying to agree with, as I said, is that people have a greater understanding on pet bereavement and how it affects the owner. Huge, huge thing as well that we've worked on um, has been pet theft. And the reason I brought that into today's is because during um, lockdown, there's been a massive increase in pet theft and the loss that people have through um, their pet being stolen is tremendous in the sense there is no closure. And I think that it's difficult enough when a pet dies and you, you need to breathe. No closure about where your animal has gone, what's happened to it. And in most cases, you never do know. I think that is an awfully lot harder to, to grieve and to, to move on from than when you've had your dog or your animal has died. And we've seen pet theft increase hugely because um, of cost of animals, that people are looking for animals more. And I don't think that whilst we have microchips, that it's taken as seriously as it should be. And um, as a charity, we've campaigned that the sentence is increased so that it's not seen as losing a mobile phone or a piece of equipment, that it's actually an, a living animal. And I know that there are, there are inroads into this, and I hope that when it does happen, it will prove to, to change people's outlook on pet theft of animals. Now, I talked about the impact of COVID then on pet theft, but it's also what we found through our service is when people have been contacting us, the greatest um, struggle they've, they've had is not being able to be with their pets at the end. And I know that uh, Zoe talked about this, and I did want to talk about it slightly because it all fits in. And it's a huge, huge loss to somebody when you can't be there at the end. It's, you know, it's, it's the challenge of you can't be there, so you have no closure. It's were they okay? Did they suffer? But also the impact on the animal itself and on those that have to carry out the, the act of, of euthanizing the animal is huge when it's, it's not there with its owner. So we've had a lot of people uh, ring us and say that they feel they've had no closure, that it's affecting them more. Um, and it, it, it's something that we're gonna see a lot of, I think, in, in the time to come. But what you will find in a minute, I'll talk about something um, that we've looked at as a service and that the impact that COVID will have on grief and the way people do work and suffer. Another huge thing that we, we find with the service we provide and an increase again during lockdown has been mental health and well-being. Um, the mental health 
of callers, an increased number of sadly suicide callers, people at the lowest ebb. We've had um, a large number of people who've been unable to go through other services because their opening hours have, have been reduced or they're not open due to the effects of COVID. Um, and not only that, we've also experienced calls from people within the professions that work with animals because they're finding that it's a great uh, impact on their mental health and well-being. Day in, day out, they're only dealing with emergencies or euthanasia. So you can imagine that the, the well-being of the vet and the vet teams has been huge. Um, you know, they're working in environments where the, the stress and the strain of what's going on around them is impacted then by the fact that, that that's all the cases they're seeing. So again, we've seen this and we've worked with it. But the biggest thing that we've noticed, and with many years of working and supporting training in the areas of pet loss, the one word that cropped up numerously was the word guilt. Time and time again, we saw the word guilt come into conversations, emails, because guilt plays a large part in many owners' grief. And this is where it suddenly sort of tends to differentiate between human and animal loss. Euthanasia, as Zoe talked about, was a huge one because people, we often heard say, I feel like I've signed the death warrant or I've murdered my animal, or I took part in the killing of my animal. And they're really strong words. However, that's how people felt. It's not down to communication. It's not down to anything that happens in the vets. It's just us when we're grieving. And if we've had to play a part uh, in signing those pieces of paper at the vets and making that decision, it massively, massively impacts on the owners. Another thing that we've seen is people feel guilty about cost. Lots of people can't afford insurance or they're not available to or in an area where they can get free vet treatment or help towards the cost. So the guilt comes about in that they can't afford to give their animal what they really feel that they need to. So it could be the cost of the treatment. It could be that, um, you know, that they just can't afford to do it and what is best that they feel for the vet. So again, they feel guilty over it. So we touched on this as well, and, and obviously their expertise is, is through vets, but we see this day in, day out. It's about the owner's lack of understanding about the quality of life of the animal. And often we hear the person say, I did it too soon, I did it too late, or they hold on as long as they can because for whatever reason they feel it's in the animal's best interest when really it's in the owner's. Um, and then they start to overthink about was it too too late again, like I said, and the guilt creeps into it. That's where we feel that in the, in the main, we always advise people to speak to those with the knowledge of their veterinary practices. When we have people who come through to us um, and obviously they, they want to say this is how they feel because the lack of understanding is there, the only people that really, really can help them are to go back to the experts and explain to them. We get people who want second opinions, we want people who want to, to spend lots of money, they've seen on TV, X, Y, and Z, um, and they then start to feel guilty that they couldn't do that, but it might not have been right for their animal and its quality of life. And like I said, with euthanasia uh, during COVID, the not being there at the end has caused people a huge amount of grief. You know, they, they've had to either have the, their animal, if they've been lucky enough, and that's not a good word to use, I understand, but if the vet's able to come out and do it in the car, or they've been able to sit in the garden outside the vets and it's be done, or in lots of cases, we've heard about people having to leave them at the door, they walked away, or they carried away, and it's the last time they see their pet. And I, you know, I can't imagine that heartache. I did have an occasion where I had to take my pair to the vets because they'd eaten something they shouldn't. And I just thought the emotions that I was going through, if they were just a small amount of what people go through when they can't be with their pets when they eat these, it must be horrendous. And for some people, they feel guilty being because they don't quite understand. Whilst the vets communicate to them what's going to happen, what they'll see, a lot of people still only remember the things that you know the eyes were still open that the noises because we only sort of hone in because of our heightened state of awareness the last bits not realizing although we've been told what we can expect what will actually happen so again people do feel guilt at being there at the end now when i talk about grief and when we train grief um, we talk about the grief cycle and i brought this in as well because Lots of people, obviously, when they lose beloved things, it causes us to grieve. Many of us different ways because none of us are the same. But the model that we tend to still use, and um, 
we do as well, or we did as a charity, is the Kubler-Ross model from 1969. Whilst it's um, based on human and it's a very good grief cycle and, you know, there's the five stages, the seven stages, or if you actually look into it, there's about 70 stages in theory when you look at a full model. It's back from 1969. So what we've decided over the years now, where we're working with animals, um, we came up with the Blue Cross Animal Grief Cycle. And it's only been in the past sort of year or so that we've finalised working with it because we found that whilst there were crossovers, there's also uniqueness. So if we take a look at the Blue Cross Grief Cycle for Animals, you can see the first stage that we looked at was anticipatory grief. And I know that Zoe touched on this because we also feel that it's a vital part of when we grieve for an animal. When we get to that announcement at the vets, if that our pet is terminally ill, the things that we then tend to think about are not what we can do to make it the last few months or weeks or days better. We instantly start to go into anticipatory grief. And we find that time and time again, people are going to shock, they deny it, um, they have outbursts, but we find that anticipatory grief is a huge part of the grieving cycle that involves pets. Nothing's linear. So when I talk about this, it's not, even though I'm going to go around in a circle, nothing ever tends to follow the circle. Because as you know, with grief, people can hop around, people can just jump from start to finish um, and go out and they instantly get a new pet. But that again is the way they'll deal with it. The next thing that we felt was a huge part of, of animal loss was responsibility grief. Because we felt that uh, a lot of us feel that because our animals are unable to communicate in many ways with us and we're responsible they are responsible for then their demise. Did we do the right thing? Did we give them the right food? Was it my, uh, the way I walked that day, the route I took that caused them to be injured? You know, it was human beings. We often take on a huge amount of grief and responsibility with our animals is huge. Self-criticism, you know, we, we start to instantly feel guilty. And that's where the word guilt comes in massively again to the pet grief cycle. A bit like human grief then, we have anger, we can stop um, asking if we can pay more, like I said, have a second opinion. Um, you know, I've seen it happen on TV, can I take it and have X, Y and Z done? And we start to say things to, to help our pain. Um, some of it can be, you know, people vocalise it, people can be violent. What we're saying as well is, is this is a huge part of grief. Um, but it's not acceptable if it's directed at you. So we have to hasten and, and sort of add that to it. And then as you can see on the outside, this isn't in our original and won't be in our one going forward, but complicated grief through COVID because people haven't had that closure. Um, there's going to be an awful lot of people going forward who will suffer from, from, from you know, that they're not closure and not having that grief, that uh, an end to that grief because they weren't there at the end. They obviously may um, have had the ashes back and carried out a service or they may have memorialised but there's always that bit in the middle that they're, they're going to be thinking about. So it's not built into our model, but it's crept in slowly on the side just while we're working over the next sort of few months or years. Then we decided that um, we see people at all different levels of depth of despair from, from sort of uh, mild depression to an ebb where you'd never want to be. They withdraw from, from all aspects of living and they feel in their own reality and they have anxiety. They, they don't want to go out. Um, and that's a really, really low ebb that we see very often with people when they've lost a pet because routine may go out of their life. Old people, it may have been their only companion or a lost love um, because it was a link to a lost one. So we, we often see that as well with the service we provide. And then we have what we call new beginnings. They start to renew, they start to socialise a bit more, go out. It may be that, um, you know, they have new interests they may get a new pet they may decide that they you know they want to do pet walking or just associate with uh, a neighbor or a friend's pet initially but they start to see that there is light at the end of the tunnel and then it becomes acceptance and hope and when we say acceptance it means that they learn to live with it they can remember good memories they laugh they cry they share all the memories that they had with their pet so if, as you can see, we've really worked hard at thinking how grief affects the pet owner more so than the grief cycle when we lose a human. There are crossovers. Um, and again, you know, it, it's not the uniqueness of owning a pet, um, again, can be affected by if it's an assistance animal and it's a link to, to actually your life and your living. But you'll find that some of these areas will creep into that as well. 
Now, um, I was looking earlier on the chat box and I noticed that Corey had put some messages in there. And I want to say to Corey, please, please, just remember and have all those good memories. Don't dwell on things. Um, but if you do want to get in touch with us, you're more than welcome because it, you know, sometimes unresolved grief or listening to things that you've seen or heard today, please don't let it affect the memories that you have and the love you had, because it's really important that, um, you know, we're looking at this from all different aspects. There are some fantastic pet crematoriums out there, fantastic vets. Um, we work with lots of them and, there's a small minority and I promise you it's like anything in life a small minority so um, I'm going to say before I say thank you I'm going to just touch on that um, thanks to uh, Nikki as well then about the uh, the box information I was thinking it would make a really good memory box as well um, because there are lots of ways that you can memorialize your pets as you are aware um, you know and as a charity, we, we do recommend to people that it is a good way. So it could be um, a main one we tend to think of is make it something that if you move, so you plant a bush or a bush or a small tree, you can take a picture. Because you have to always remember that sometimes when we memorialise things, um, leaving it behind can be really difficult. But uh, if you want any further information or anything on what we do, you are more than welcome to, to give us a shout. And I 